Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Bill Nort from Ortho Virginia, sitting here at our um, live from our orthopedic uh, studios at, at our Parham office. Um, I'm here to um, discuss some things I do for a living. Um, um, I'd like to thank our uh, Orsa Virginia, Margaret and Aaron for uh, putting this operation on. It's not easy. And um, the goal would be just to um, answer as many questions as possible. Obviously, our makeup artist called in sick this morning, so this is what you get. And, um, and so here we go. Um, I am an orthopedic surgeon, as most of you know by now. Um, my specialty is knee and shoulder surgery, uh, knees in general, and um, my particular expertise is probably a knee replacement surgery and cartilage surgery. Um, I do a lot with orthobiologics, which uh, have uh, heretofore been known as uh, stem cell injections. Um, so uh, anything in regards to those uh, areas of orthopedics, um, feel free to ask away. Um, we, um, uh, the, the topic that I thought would be interesting would be about knee replacements and um, uh, what can you do after knee replacement? How fast can you go? And, um, and what ultimately are the expectations? It's interesting that patients expect that their knee is going to be great after knee replacement and although that's largely true it's not completely true um one has to get it right for that to be true and people are more interested in how fast one can recover from a knee replacement and although that certainly is important we all want to get better as fast as possible ultimately the goal is just to have uh your knee as close to a normal knee as possible um knee replacements are uh, uh, objectively still uh, a harder operation to get right as compared to, for instance, a, knee, a hip replacement. Um, the reason for that is complicated, but essentially your hip is a ball and socket joint and the hip really just rotates around one center of rotation. And as long as you get that one point right, you'll have a good hip. Um, a knee is a much more complicated structure. Of course, it, it bends like a, like a hinge but it has all these subtle motions of sliding and slipping and rotating as it bends. And the knee motion is very complicated when you straighten and bend your knee. It rotates and straightens and it, and it slides as it rotates. And these motions are all very complicated. And getting all these subtle motions right in the knee replacement is um, quite a, a complicated uh, undertaking. And at the end of the day, that's what's important to get right. Um, um, I'm a fan of what's known as a robotic knee replacement. Um, we get a CAT scan of your knee. Um, the, at the time, we actually build your knee replacement virtually before the surgery, which can take an hour or two sometimes. Um, and then, so we have a plan of what we think exactly how your knee replacement will be um, to, to optimize the relationships I talked about. And then um, we make some adjustments during the surgery. We lock in our plan. And then, um, and then we move in a robotic arm that um, I operate as a surgeon. And as um, I'm sure many of you know by now, um, a knee replacement is just really a resurfacing of the bone. We remove a very small amount of surface, maybe a quarter of an inch um, of the end of your bone. So it's a new surface on each side of the bone. And uh, on the top side, it's, it's a metal. On the bottom side, it's a metal component. And between these two metal components, it's like a Teflon plastic spacer. And um, the robot is used to remove those thin slices of bone from the end of the joints. And if we can remove them with great precision as to how we put the knee replacement in, it can be rotated a little bit this way, it can be rotated a little bit that way, it can be rotated upward, it can be moved out, it can be moved in. So there are a multitude of very minute adjustments one has to make. And in the game of um, a good, uh, a, a, a successful knee replacement, it's really a game of millimeters or actually micromillimeters. And the robot allows us to have this precision of a half a millimeter and a half a degree and at the end of the day, that's the difference between a B plus and an A plus knee. 
and we're all heading for a quote unquote, a knee that feels like a normal knee. That's a, that's a hard goal to achieve, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and then uh, if you get the knee replacement right, um, the, um, the overall performance of the knee um, will be improved. And just to go down that road a little bit, um, the, the, the question is, is what can I do with that sort of as a background discussion as to how you put a knee replacement in and the importance of getting everything um, exactly right. That really determines sort of how, what the hell the knee will function long term. And by function, I mean like how close does the knee feel like a normal knee and how long does the knee last? And if we get it right, it can feel darn close to a normal knee and uh, our expectation would be it would last a lifetime. Now that certainly might mean a lot uh, behind that is, is how long you live, of course, and how active you are. We used to say, um, we used to say that, you know, you better protect your knee. You better be careful with your knee. You better not overdo it because like a tire, the more wear you put on it, the sooner it's going to wear out. And um, that thinking has started to, to sort of reverse itself a little bit. And um, if the question is, is why do knee replacements wear out? Um, generally, it's been two reasons historically. One is, is that Teflon plastic liner that I mentioned a minute ago will wear. Um, and that can wear down over time. And um, if a knee is put in correctly, um, and the emphasis there is incorrectly, which gets back to sort of the, the exactitude of using a robot. If a knee is put in correctly, the Teflon liner, that plastic liner, it's actually polyethylene, a high density polymer, should last 30 years and maybe more. Um, but it should last, if I can use the term forever. Um, so that problem has been resolved. The, the, the Teflon, the polyethylene liner wearing out has not now shown to be the number one problem. Probably the, at the, what's moved to the top of the list is how the prosthesis attached to the bone. And um, there are traditional techniques, which is using an epoxy cement, and that's still used everywhere. And I'll still use that to some degree. Um, but there's also a new technology, which is called quote unquote press fit where the surface of the prosthesis is actually 3D printed to have an architecture that mimics the architecture of bone itself. And, um, and your bone actually integrates into the prosthesis and that's what connects the prosthesis to the bone. And in theory, um, that, that um, never wears out. Um, and so it never decouples, at least that sort of thinking. So the point is, is that you know, the, the number one and number two modes of failure of knee replacements over long term have largely been resolved. Now, that's not meant to say or imply that every knee replacement is going to last for 30 or 40 or 50 years. But you'll see when we look at um, longevity of knee replacements, you'll see in those first five years, there's a failure rate. And then after that, for decades, it seems to more or less level out. And sure, it does go down a little bit over time, but um, but knee replacements, if, if they last the first few years, they seem to really, really, really want to last a long, long time. Um, is it for sure going to be the last operation you have? Not necessarily, but there's a pretty good chance of that. If you do a knee replacement, even in your 50s, there's a pretty darn good chance of that, that. And then number two is what can I, so will it last a lifetime? The answer is, is quite probably um, done correctly. And then number two, um, and maybe there's three points. Um, um, number two might be how fast I'll recover. And number three would be um, what can I do with the knee replacement? Maybe let's get to number three. Um, uh, uh, again, we used to think that the more you did it on knee replacement, there's the, the greater the likelihood that it'll wear out. But if anything, the studies are showing that the people that are more active have knee replacements that actually tend to last longer. It's the reverse of what our thinking has been for decades. And it wasn't that long ago when I would tell patients, you really should take care of your knee, not be on it too hard, not do too many impact acti activities not do uh, repetitive, stressful, and strenuous activities. 
But um, over the years, I've gotten closer and closer to just knowing patients, be reasonable, but go for it. Um, and if you're a tennis player, gently sort of um, wade into the waters of playing tennis. If you're a runner, gently wade into the waters of running. Um, for instance, you know, start with a walk run program and slowly over time increase sort of the distance and the strenuousness of which you do your activity. Dean, for sure. Um, golfing, of course, for sure. But impact activities, now short of contact sports, okay, I don't think anybody would recommend you would play contact sports, but, but um, repetitive activities of uh, what we would call significant um, level of, uh, of strenuousness, it would seem that knee replacements will hold up, it would seem. Um, the answer really is an end. It's not like there are studies that say we did 100 knee replacements of level one activity and 100 knee replacements of level two activity and so on and so on and compared them over the course of 20 years. That data is not out there. So I'm getting on a limb a little bit when I talk about this, but but it, but we're, we're slowly but surely trying to get people back to very high levels of activity, if not um, what you would call quote unquote, absolutely normal activities um, and um, being quite strenuous with the knee replacement. And it all comes down to, like I said, getting the knee replacement right, which is number one um, on the list of important things. Um, and then the question always comes up is how fast is the recovery from the knee replacement? Listen, it's never a picnic. There are multiple techniques of, um, of how to put uh, of soft tissue manipulation, of how we address the knee replacement. Um, we really want to do um, uh, a ligamentous uh, uh, sparing uh, procedure. Uh, we really want to do, to the extent we can, a, a minimally invasive procedure. But at the end of the day, you do have to get into the knee joint. And at the end of the day, you do have to remove the surface of the knee. So it's never going to be a completely atraumatic process to have a knee replacement. But um, but year by year, we get closer and closer to a, uh, uh, a recovery process that people are finding um, quite manageable. And, um, and by that, you know, we hope to have you sort of, uh, I had a fellow I saw this morning that was doing fairly significant biking three weeks out of his knee after his knee replacement. It's probably a little bit of an exception, um, but by six weeks for sure. So that three week to six week, the first few weeks for sure, you're going to be slow. Um, we don't want you to overdo it. Um, rule number one is to manage the swelling of your knee and then at about week three we sort of try to push start pushing you um, and some people um, can push it pretty hard and go fast and by six weeks for sure everybody is um, cruising pretty hard with their knee replacement now you'll see recovery month by month little by little all the way up to three months six months and even a little bit up to a year um, but um, but we get you going early and we get you going hard um, now, uh, with that said, Margaret, let's start some questions because I'm sure there's going to be time and I really wanted this to be more about questions than me just talking, but I think that kind of gives the background for anything people would want to ask. So, um, so fire away. Absolutely. Hey. Thank you so much, Dr. Nort. Our first question is about age restrictions. Are there upper age restrictions or lower age restrictions on knee replacements? Um, so, um, one of which I'm sure will be many questions. I will say um, people under 50, we sort of really take a deep breath before we do a knee replacement. We will do patients in their 40s. We will do patients even in their early 40s. In their 30s, it really gets rare. So, um, uh, 40s, one will do them. Um, one will be a little more aggressive with possibly a partial knee replacement in their 40s rather than a total knee replacement. In their 50s, it's very common to do knee replacements in their 50s these days. I have several on every week, people in their 50s. And then I think my record is a 93-year-old. Um, same thing. Um, one has to take a long pause and think about it hard when people are in their upper 80s and their 90s. We did my, um, Dr. Shia, my partner, did my mother at 87. 
and um, and so uh, and who's by the way doing quite well, and um, and so we um, as long as the patient is healthy, as long as we think that they can tolerate the procedure, um, there really is no age limit. Thank you. You mentioned partial and full replacements. How do you determine if someone should have a partial replacement or a full replacement? Now that's a yeah, many times every day, and it's a, it's not that easy to answer, um, but uh, it's really a discussion we have to have. And there's lots of sort of little um, nuancey type things that would need to be discussed. But in general, if the wear and tear on your knee is in one air isolated to one area of your knee, and not sort of encompassing the whole knee, you may be a candidate for a partial knee replacement. Now, um, here's the here's the rub. A partial knee replacement is really a sweet operation, if I can use that term. I mean, um, it's the recovery is surprisingly quick. Um, you're back on your feet very quickly. And in six weeks, I mean, you're doing really good. At three weeks, you're getting around good. And at six weeks, you're getting around great with a that's our expectation of a partial knee. That's the upside. Maybe the number two upside is if the partial knee does just tend to feel more like a normal knee. So we love doing partial knees. Um, but there's a downside of a partial knee. Whereas, as I mentioned before, a full knee replacement is really likely to last you uh, a lifetime. A partial knee, I'm just going to throw a number out there. It's more in the 50-50 range. And it's not that the partial knee replacement itself wears out. It's the fact that the um, the other parts of your knee that we don't replace can go on to become arthritic. And that, that arthritic area of the unreplaced surface of your knee can go on to become painful. Now, that's usually 15 years. You know, it can be 10, it can be 20. But you are keeping your fingers crossed a little bit if you're to do a partial knee replacement because it may or may not last your lifetime. Thank you. What kind of anesthesia is used? Well, almost everybody, number one, almost everybody gets a nerve block. That's when we numb the nerves that go to your knee, to your leg. And nerve blocks usually last the better part of 24 hours, for sure 12 hours. I will say it can depend on the patient, the anesthesiologist. Um, and um, but we, we expect to get a, a fairly good response to the nerve blocks, and that's what generally controls your knee pain. Um, it allows us to do outpatient knee replacements, whether it be a partial or a full, um, should the patient want to do it that way, because we really can control the, the discomfort after the knee replacement quite effectively with the nerve block. And then in addition to the nerve block, it's um, there's two other things we do, inject your knee with numbing medication um, at the end of the surgery. And then the last thing, it's either a spinal or a general anesthesia. There are merits of both of them. Um, the spinal, you wake up clearly, and that's really nice. Um, uh, however, um, the spinal does take a, uh, some time to wear off. If you get a spinal, you generally need a catheter for at least a few hours. And so there are some there are some pros and cons of a spinal anesthesia versus a general anesthesia. Um, as patients get elderly, we tend to lean more towards the spinal anesthesia. In younger patients, we tend to lean a little bit more towards the general anesthesia. But that's the discussion to have with your orthopedic surgeon um, uh, as to what they think is the best thing. and. And um, and uh, they can guide you accordingly. Thank you. After knee replacement, how soon can you go up and down stairs, and how soon can you drive? Um, the we 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 stairs the day of surgery. So now I'm not going to say you're going to be flying up and down flights of stairs the day of surgery, but um, if you do leave the day, of, excuse me, if you do leave the day of surgery as an outpatient. We actually, um, the therapist sees you before you leave the hospital and you're able to do stairs. Now, with difficulty, you know, good leg, bad leg, good leg, bad leg, um, with somebody standing with you. But um, but generally speaking, stairs are doable the day of surgery. Um, uh, and then driving. Um, it's variable. Uh, right leg versus left leg. 
but a few weeks, a few weeks. And again, um, there's driving, um, and then there's driving safely. Um, you're not going to hurt your knee to drive. Um, the question is, is, you know, don't kill yourself. So, uh, you, you, you really just have to make that decision. And certainly if it's your right knee, if it's your, in, if it's your left knee, um, two or three weeks, if it's your right knee, it could be three or four weeks, but, um, that's a decision that generally we make the darkest ups you make. And we really are aggressive with physical therapy after a knee replacement. Um, because for that very reason, now the first two weeks. The therapy is, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's really more about swelling control and getting the soreness out of your knee and getting this incision to heal and getting your knee range of motion going. And then after a couple of weeks, we really start to push it. And that's when we get you back to your activities, such as driving. Next. Thank you. Do you cut uh, along the top of the knee or the side of the knee? So, okay. I'm glad that's, I meant to get to that. Um, I mentioned during the, my preface there that there are approaches to a knee, um, to, to sort of how we operate on the knee. And um, there are a variety of, of, of approaches. Um, the standard approach is number one, um, the incision is down the middle of the knee. And then how, after we go through the incision, there are a couple ways we can do this. Um, uh, I, I, there's an approach um, that's been around for decades. So my incision is just down the front of the knee. And I would say probably 99% of orthopedic surgeons in the world, it's that way. I've certainly done incisions every way. Um, there are some patients that come in with previous, previous incisions and we like to use their old incisions and they're on either side of the knee and we can do it every which way. But at the end of the day, you want to do it in a way that's really safe. And by safe, it's like, um, if you encounter any type of unforeseen problem, you have to be able to manage that problem. And your your incisions and your approach to that may really start to um, play a role there. Um, once we go through the, and so the standard, what's known as midline approach down the center of the knee, gives us the variability to address different problems. So there be a problem towards the inside of the knee. So if you made an incision on the outside of the knee, and you had to deal with a problem that was on the towards the inner side of your knee, you could be in a problem. By going down, you could be in a situation, a, a difficult situation. If you go down the center of the knee, it allows you to sort of manage any potential issues. So I think most of us feel that that's, that's a, a paramount importance. Now, once you go through the skin, um, one can kind of uh, split the tendon and go into the knee that way. That's the tradition, traditional approach. There's also there's also an uh, approach called the subdesis approach where we still literally move the tissue to the side. I'm a fan of the subdesis approach. I don't use it in everybody. Um, there are some um, uh, this with this the same proviso as I mentioned earlier. There are some situations um, heavy burly people. Um, I, I tend to sort of move away from the subvastus approach, subvastus approach, which is going under um, the tissue. Um, um, you can actually damage the quadriceps tendon. You can actually grip tendons if um, if the patient's not not the appropriate one for the subvastus approach. It's been the subvastus approach. What's it? called the spiffy knee, what's it called, Aaron? The jiffy knee. Yeah, there's, there's a orthopedic surgeon who apparently trademarked that term, who who I'm sure is quite a good surgeon, who um, who popularized that term for the sub approach. Like I said, it's been around for decades, and I don't know any orthopedic surgeon that can't do it if he wanted to do it. I do like doing it. I do it on a lot of my knees, but not all of my knees for the reasons I just mentioned. And then here's the question. Is there a difference in recovering from the subvastus or the quote-unquote tiffy approach um, to the standard approach? And the research tells you there's very little difference. Now, again, in, in, in patients that I, that I do feel are um, selectively um, indicated for the sub or like I said, the Tiffy approach. I like it and I do use it and I've been using it for years and years and years. And um, and and there's probably a, 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 a modest uh, reason to do the sub approach. Um, but I will say this, of the 30 things you want to get right um, um, in a knee replacement, 
I would put the uh, Subvastus or Jiffy at 20 on. Um, there are so many more things that have to sort of be right to give you that knee replacement that number one um, feels like a normal knee. And by that, it has to be strong, it has to be flexible, and it has to be stable. And number two, a knee that will last your lifetime. The approach to the knee, um, the subvastus or 50 approach is the, the, if anything, one has to be careful that you don't sacrifice the more important things for the approach. Um, like I said earlier, I mean, we all, me included, want to recover from knee surgery as quickly as possible. But way, way more important is, is that you have a strong, stable knee that lasts you a lifetime. And, and, um, and you know, my recommendation is, is, you know, you find a surgeon that you have a lot of faith in, that has a good rapport with you, that has a good reputation, and you go with that guy. Um, or the Virginia, just as an aside, I mean, we have dozens of great joint replacement surgeons. Any one of them, I'd let them do my knee replacement in a minute. Um, I mean, why I'm, why I'm on this, um, you know, with the Virginia is, um, it's a rare nationally recognized uh, private orthopedic clinic. Um, we, for surgeons to get a job with North of Virginia, I mean, we only take the best in the country. And um, and so, you, you know, generally speaking, if you're going to a joint replacement surgeon in North of Virginia, you're going to get really, really a top guy. Um, and uh, from the guys that had the option to be a chairman of an orthopedic park department or work for Orsa Virginia. That's sort of the, the quality of the surgeons we get in our clinic. So, so find your guy, stick with them, um, feel like he's going to be like, uh, trust in what he's telling you, how he does it. And, um, and chances are very high. You're going to have a really good outcome. How do you know if a knee replacement needs to be replaced? And so if a knee needs to be replaced, well, there are basically two major criteria for a knee replacement. One is to say you're bone on bone on x-ray and two, you say this knee is so significantly compromising the quality of my life that I'm just, I've had it. And um, now that's very subjective and that's patient to patient but you really feel like you've tried everything and that the quality of your life um, is so compromised that um, you're just not doing the things you wanna to do to sustain the level of function that you need to live a happy, healthy life. Now that's different for everybody, but you know, um, listen, if you're saying to me, I can't play tennis anymore, I need my knee replaced, I might say, well, can't you you know, walk and can't you play pickleball, pickleball or can't you swim? Um, but if you're saying to me, I have trouble going to Target or Lowe's, um, I can't go on trips with my family, I'm lagging behind, um, I'm just not doing the things that one needs to do to live a, to live a, a happy life, that's what we're here for. Thank you. During surgery, what steps are taken to prevent infection? Um, so, number one, I mean, Infection is probably the biggest bugaboo in any surgery, whether it's orthopedics or anywhere. Um, uh, uh, number one, you know, the infection rate of the facility um, uh, and, and the, the facility itself is important. I mean, we are all over that. Everybody's over that. All facilities that do surgery have to answer to governing bodies that sort of look at their infection rates and all infections have to be reported that go into a national database. So, so as far as the, the sterility and cleanliness of it and hygiene of a facility, that's really overseen from a regulatory, national regulatory basis. Um, number two, um, for sure, uh, um, one gets antibiotics uh, during surgery um, and um, that's important. Number three, we use antibiotics sort of in the operation itself. And number four, um, it, and this gets back a little bit to what I said earlier, um, you know, there's a period after surgery where the knee 
doesn't want to be pushed too hard. And that's two days, three days. You really want your incision to heal. You want it to seal up. You want the drainage to stop. And um, and then after that, you can start pushing them hard. And so I, in my own experiences, it's really that first several day period where we do want you to walk, we do want you to bend your knee, but we do want you to keep moving, but we don't want you to overdo it. And then once you get through that first several days, one can start pushing it. Um, there are things we used to, you know, bleeding used to be, it, 20 years ago, I mean, it wasn't that unusual at all for a patient to get a unit of blood or two units of blood after a knee replacement. Now, with these medications we use and these techniques we use, it is so rare to need blood after knee replacement. I can't even remember. Five years um, that, that a patient has gotten a unit of blood. So, in terms of just controlling the problems around a knee replacement that may lead to an infection, we've gotten really good at that. And, you know, the incidence of infection is really low, um, under 1% in my practice. Thank you so much, Dr. Nort. That is all the questions that we have time for today. If you have asked a question while we are live on Facebook, we will answer it in the comments on Facebook. Dr. Nort, would you like to close? Um, um, uh, only because I get this, I get asked this 10 times a day. I'm not retiring soon. Aaron, is that okay with you? Margaret, you're all right with that? Okay, and um, so I'm going to be around for a long time, I hope. And uh, I really just love my job. I love taking care of patients, and uh, I hope to be doing this for a long time. So thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning in.